Pastor Ron Green. It's my privilege to stand in this morning for Pastor John Pollock. Pastor uh, Pollock is away on a Sunday of vacation today, and I think the Thanksgiving holiday just got a little bit longer. Uh, so, Pastor <laughs> Pollock, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, a day of rest, and I think he's visiting the family. So, uh, it's my privilege to be here and to be among you. Uh, some of you uh, we perhaps have crossed paths in the past. I'm the recently retired pastor to the agency and director of a few other things, of fundraising, public relations, church relations, uh, development, all that kind of stuff, at Oster and Services for Youth, and I served there for 24 years and retired a few months ago. So even though I'm no longer officially on that staff, uh, coming here to St. John gives me an opportunity to say thank you to all of you. So many folks in this congregation have been supporters in so many ways. Uh, volunteers, your individual gifts uh, to our appeals, perhaps you participated in our benefit auction. And I know very well that year after year you hosted the Women's Auxiliary card party downstairs, etc. So in so many ways, uh, you folks over the years have been part and parcel of the ministry of Oster, and I thank you so much for that. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, today, of course, is the first Sunday in Advent. Uh, we'll be saying more about that as the service <coughs> progresses. But it's, it's Happy New Year Day for the church year. The church operates on the church <coughs> calendar that's a little bit different than our secular calendar. And so today is the first day of the new liturgical year, the first Sunday in Advent. For the opening hymn, we will sing verses 1, 2, and 4. <coughs> the hymn is longer than that, but for today we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Also, we have some special music.
Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. Our opening hymn is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. This is November the 29th, the first Sunday of Advent. Our um, guest pastor is Pastor Ron Green. This hymn was written in the 9th century, was translated by John Mason Neal, who thought that the hymns of Isaac Watts were too modern, and he's translated some ancient hymns. Latin hymn, 9th century, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, translated by John Mason Neal. Read <clears throat> it's the first Sunday of Advent. And while the first candle is being lighted, we sing the first one of the hymn number two. Hark the 
Harvey Baker's lighting the first candle of the Advent wreath. Smith is leading is reading the scripture. singing the gospel acclamation and our guest pastor pastor ron green will be uh, reading the gospel Glory to 
powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard, so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. <laughs> On the violin solo by William Ayers. Is the son of Susan and Bill Ayers and the grandson of uh, Dr. Sally Abbott and Dr. Jim Pompuj's uh, Thanksgiving hymn.
Grace be unto you, mercy and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I mentioned a few moments ago that today is New Year's Day in liturgical year, the church year. It's the first Sunday in Advent. And Advent is a season that consists of four Sundays before Christmas. The word Advent is a Latin word which means to come. And we are thinking during these four Sundays about the coming of God dramatically intervening and making God's self known in God's creation. And so for Christian people, that is a thinking together about two events. The first event is God incarnate come to dwell among us full of grace and truth in the person of God's only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ. And so one of the comings of our God into God's creation in a dramatic form is the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus at Christmas time. But there is another advent as well, for as Jesus completed his earthly ministry, and as he ascended into heaven, and he was no longer present on earth among his disciples and followers, he promised that he would come back again. I shall come back and dwell among you again. And in the fullness of time, so also will come the fullness of God's plan for God's creation. And Jesus even said that he himself did not know when that would be, only the Father knows. But he said, I promise you that I shall come again. And that is what we refer to as the second coming of Jesus. And so the season of Advent is the thinking about both the first coming and the second coming. And as God's people living in this time, this part of God's whole unfolding plan, we are the people who live between the comings. The people who know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and who know God revealed through Him and know that to the depth of our core of the first coming and yet also live still anticipating the second coming. And knowing not when that might be, even if Jesus himself said. And so the question for us, the uh, task for us, the challenge for us during the season of Advent is to not only prepare our hearts and minds to receive the baby Jesus at Christmas, but also to reconsider and rethink our lives all the way through such that are we living that should that end time, the second coming, happen even in our own time, are we prepared and ready to meet our Lord? And how, as Christian people, do we live in that sense of preparedness? And so, as we consider those experiences, there are, of course, the times when, when the cosmos seems to shake. There are those times that, that seem unusual or particularly painful or seem to be so out of the ordinary that even very reasonable down-to-earth folk who, who aren't given easily to uh, some kind of panic or jumping to a conclusion might rightly wonder, are these the income? Is this it? And so, one of those occasions that brings this kind of thinking back to mind is, is what's happened in the last couple weeks with respect to <coughs> the terrorist attacks in Paris and the world's response to that. And I was chatting downstairs during the Sunday school hour with Jeff Dunmire, who was not only in Paris, but in the Eiffel Tower. Uh, you probably saw the article on the front page of the newspaper uh, a couple weeks ago about his experiences and what he was talking about. But then, of course, there have been times before that when folks might have wondered, is this the beginning of the end of the world as we know it? Our own country on 9-11 surely was shook to our roots by the experiences of that day. And then, since then, the 
the subway bombings in London and Madrid and multiple other situations in Mumbai, literally around the globe, where it seems as though an evil force <coughs> is somehow taking over, grabbing hold and, and perhaps shaking to the core, if not destroying our sense of, of who we are about. And it causes us not only to look at what's happening, but, but where is God in all of this? And there are the natural disasters, the earthquakes, the hurricanes, the forest fires, the changing climates, and, and how that changes everything from storms to temperatures to the depth of the oceans. And we're asking ourselves, is this when God is coming forth? Is, is today the day? And I think in, in my years in ministry, that question becomes more poignantly structured and, and focused, not so much in, in great big events as much as in smaller, even personal events. For it is true that, that whatever God is up to cosmically and whatever God might do that, so also we live individually. And each of us lives our own life and our own life experience. And we are aware that our temporal body is exactly that, temporal, temporary. And so as we live our lives on earth, we think about the end times for ourselves or for others whom we love. I know that many of you know Juanita Aukman and her late husband, Fred. And presently, since Pastor Leslie Fox has uh, left Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, uh, and I'm a member there, I'm serving as one of the interim, interim, interim pastors over there until such time as a more permanent interim gets appointed while that congregation, my congregation, searches for a new pastor. And so I got the phone call this week from Bev Kitchen that Juanita needed a pastor because she had just learned that her daughter in Columbus had died. And for Juanita, this is the second of her and Fred's four daughters who has died from complications of a genetically inherited disease known as Wilson's. And so I'm talking with Juanita. And for Juanita, these days are, she's thinking and, and reflecting on and praying on what are and have been the end times in her own family. And she told me, Pastor, it was so hard to lose our first daughter and now to lose a second of our four daughters. It just is so shaky. But she also said, I stand firm in my faith. And I will, by God's grace and by God's help, continue on in my life until God calls me as well to join them. I said, Juanita, what an incredible statement. And we pray together with that whole theme in mind. <clears throat> I went to see the movie this past week called The 33, and maybe some of you have seen that. It's the story of the collapse of the mine in Chile in 2010, the true story of the 33 miners who, when that mine collapsed, were caught, uh, fortunately, in a safe place, a, a refuge room, but unfortunately, 2,100 feet below ground level. And the mine had collapsed on the top and the mountain had fallen in and there were no uh, avenues of escape uh, to get out into the sunlight. And the, the geologists that gathered on the top surface and began putting their sonars and everything else down into it realized that the piles of rock twice as large and twice as heavy as the Empire State had fallen in on top of those miners. And they had, in the safe place where they were, they had enough food and water for three days for 33 fellows. They were all alive and safe and, and in fact not injured because these were experienced miners and they realized when the rumble started what they needed to do and how they needed to do it very quickly and they got to this safe place. 
But who was going to get to them within three days? And yet what happened? Did they lose all hope? Did they just become every person for himself? Did they just begin to struggle and, and survive of the fittest for as long as we might have and we're all going to be dead anyway? Well, you know the story. I mean, this is, you know, there's no spoiler here. This is a true story. And you know that that didn't happen. And in fact, what did happen, and, and the movie is based on a book written by the Mayans uh, afterwards, is that they came together. They never lost hope. They began to make a plan and some were a little more agreeable than others, but they found a collective sense of community and brotherhood, and much of this was in their Roman Catholic faith, of which virtually all of the miners uh, were a part of that church, and that uh, Catholic church in Chile. And they believed that somehow God would be with them, either to the point of rescue, or if not, uh, to these were experienced miners. They knew very well what the odds were and what they were facing in this situation. But of course the story is that some borings and drillings after 10 attempts did <coughs> get the right spot and get to them. And so at first they had a three inch hole that they were able from the top to begin dropping some more food and water down. And then meanwhile they were drilling a bigger hole and a bigger hole able to get a capsule down that would be the diameter to get a human being into. And you all know the story, 69 days later, the, every one of the 33 miners came out alive and, and came to the top. And what would have happened had they not believed and found a way to bring themselves together under the extraordinary, impressing, very likely fatal. Uh, folks estimated that there maybe, maybe was a 1% chance that they could be successful in getting all 33 people out of the line alive. And they did. And, and so it, it too is a faith story. It's an Advent story. It's a story of an apocalypse in the lives of 33 people that seem to have no possible conclusion but lights out and death. And they survive. We live in the grace and glory of the saving Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus says to his followers in the Gospel lesson, when the earth shakes and, and when you see signs and stars and the sun and the moon and the waters, stand up. Jesus never says, get down, take shelter, get into your safe space, build your walls higher, arm yourself, close yourself in, but rather stand up for your God is with you and your God has brought you to this time and your God is yet even in charge of all this, even beyond our own understanding. And so, when we live between the times, we live in the utter faith of God's presence with us in any and all times, in any and all circumstances. And, and in the Jeremiah passage in the Old Testament, during the dark days of, of the exile of the people of Israel in bondage in Babylon, and Jeremiah the prophet is writing, and he says, God will raise up a branch from Jesse and in the line of King David. And this branch raised up shall execute justice and righteousness. And that word righteousness appears three times in the Old Testament lesson we read this morning. And the Hebrew word for righteousness is the same word as right relationships. Right relationships. Justice, caring, accepting, loving, right relationships. That's what righteousness is in the biblical sense. And that's exactly what God has already done through the first coming of Jesus Christ 
our Lord and Savior. And it's also what God yet does with us and for us. And as we consider how it is that, that God intervenes in God's creation, we realize that it is much more often from the inside rather than from the outside. And we know that, that we, in the second coming, and as God actively moves in the struggles and trials and tribulations of God's creation, God is much more likely to work with us and through us than over top of us. And as God is much less likely to send in a great invasion or an army and, and just destroy evil and get rid of it as much as I might wish. God, why don't you just do that and do it quickly and get this thing on, keep it going and all, you know, and get it the way you want it. I love that. But God more often says, I'm going to work from within through the transformation from within. And so our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ appears before Pilate. And Pilate says, if you are the Christ, call in a legion of angels to, to save you. And Jesus says, you know, I can do that, but I'm not going to. And when he's on the cross a day later, the soldiers say, and, and the thieves on either side of him say, if you are the Christ, take yourself down from this cross and save us too. And Jesus says, I'm not going to do it that way. And Jesus willingly dies, but then lives again and lives unto all eternity. Death is conquered by the power of God through the inside rather than from the outside. And that just seems to be the way that God and Jesus is telling us the same thing. The more grim things look, stand up. Stand up for the faith of right relationships. Stand up to love and care for each other. Stand up to welcome particularly the victims of the terror and the shaking of the cosmos. For they are my children and they are your sisters and brothers. Stand up. For your faith and all you have, you know, and I will be with you, for I am yet the King of kings and the Lord of lords of all places and times. And I know this congregation stands up. I have long known of your rainbow table and, and your mission to the least capable and, and the least able of the Springfield community. And I have long known of of your food pantry ministries and your clothes closet ministries and, and the work that you do throughout the community. And that's what God calls us to do and keep doing it and just keep doing it. And in God's time when only God knows, God will bring it all to God's plan and conclusion. But in the meantime, just keep on keeping on being the faithful servants of God's people. For the promise of Christ is real. The promise will be fulfilled in God's time. We know not when, but we know to watch and to be vigilant and to be ready at all times. For one candle is already lit. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
to make a home for his word. God of hopefulness, hear our prayer. For leaders of government, and especially those newly elected, that they may walk humbly with God, doing justice and loving kindness. God of hopefulness, hear our prayer. For those who, like Francis Xavier, have spread the gospel to people in distant lands, God of hopefulness, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. For those who are sick, or for those recovering from illness, that they may know the healing love of Christ, God of hopefulness, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. For our guests at worship, that the grace and love of Jesus Christ may keep them now and in the coming week, God of hopefulness, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. In thankfulness for loved ones and all who have gone before us, with whom we await the great heavenly feast, God of hopefulness, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. God of salvation, hear the prayers we make in the name of Jesus Christ, whose coming is certain and whose day draws near. our offering. Bill and Mary Nevius are our ushers. We're happy to have you watching us on YouTube. This is the first Sunday of Advent. You can see that we have the first purple Advent candle that was lit today by Harvey, Harvey Baker. And uh, this is the prophecy candle, the candle that honors the prophecy of Jesus coming on earth as the Messiah. The root of Jesse. We thank our pastor, guest pastor, Pastor Ron Green, here today who gave the wonderful message of we have lit one candle to welcome Messiah. This is a Yiddish melody. We sang it and we'll sing a verse each time as we ring as we light the four candles welcoming Jesus' appearance into the world and thanking God for the incarnation that he has come to save us from sin. We're no longer captives, we're free. We love to love one another, to receive God's love and to extend it to others. St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. We're happy to have you worship with us the last Sunday in November, the first Sunday in Advent. We're happy to have you and we want you to come worship in, per in person or worship with us by watching YouTube. Closing him is Blessed Be the God of Israel. It's written by Carl, Carl P. Daw, Jr., who was born in 1944. It's based on Luke 1. The music is an English folk tune, and this hymn is appropriate for the first Sunday in Advent. Blessed be the God of Israel who comes to set us free. Jesus, we're waiting for his arrival. We're celebrating Christmas 25th. We're celebrating the Incarnation.
organist Greg Nolte playing the organ as our service is uh, ended. This is November the 29th, 2015. This is the first Sunday of Advent, lighting the Advent candle. This is a wonderful tradition to help us prepare uh, the way of the Lord. This is uh, the flowers today on the chancel stand are to the glory of God, presented by Vicki Perks and family in honor of Larry Perks' birthday. Larry Perks' birthday, happy birthday to Larry, and Vicki Perks is our music director. Thank you for watching us, St. John's Church on YouTube. We are happy to have you come in person. We're happy to have you worship with us, support our ministry as we are, feel called to the downtown area to serve food, to give away clothes, to give to help the needs of the poor in our areas. God asks us every day, in every way, to help others, the poor. We to help orphans, widows, and the poor. And we can, through Jesus Christ, share the love of God, have the love of God fill us, and we can give the love of God to others. We confess our sins, we ask for forgiveness, we confess our belief in the Apostles' Creed. We've done the things God has asked us to do, and you can come worship with us today. We're happy to bring you this service. We offer Christian school programs ages three and four, uh, pre-K. Call the church office for information on our preschool. We thank you for joining our worship service this Lord's Day. I hope and I pray that God will continue to bless you and keep you this day in all your days. We will pray for you. Continue to pray for us in our YouTube ministry. Continue to uh, support us, pray for us, and we're starting the first Sunday of Advent. We invite you to light your Advent candles at home, to follow the uh, Advent to, to wreath, and uh, all the different traditions are helpful for us to remember that Jesus Christ is our Savior, died to save us from sin, and he's, we celebrate his coming, the incarnation, the 25th. We're preparing ourselves, prepare the way of the Lord just as John the Baptist said. Thank you again for watching. I invite you to come anytime to help us. Call the church office if you're able to help.